Hey everyone, welcome back to the long-awaited part two of the CNC router video. I just wanted to do a follow-up because in the first video I said some things that were wrong or dumb or you know things that I've since figured out the answer to and hopefully the part two will prevent people from feeling the need to comment on the first one and tell me why I was wrong because I already know why I was wrong. And also I wanted to go over some things that I've done, some upgrades I've made, some corrections I've done to my original design that I said I wanted to do. Just kind of show you where things are at as of today, which is I think a few months since the last video. I know in the last one the furnace was on and I was wearing flannel and today is 83 degrees in here and 90 something outside, so so here we go. Okay, so I got a little list of things I wanted to go over. Uh, I just rewatched the first video and took some notes. So first, some changes I did while we're zoomed out here, First thing you'll probably notice is the monitor and the e-stop. I mounted those to a piece of aluminum here just to get them off the table and the emergency stop obviously to make it safer. From there, we'll zoom you in and show you some of the uh, more kind of close-up things I've done. All right, the thing that was most difficult and I'm most proud of is getting actual uh, proximity sensors on here. Then up here, got those two. And I've got one at the top of the Z. Now I learned a few things dealing with these. There are, I mean, obviously I already knew this. There's normally open, there's normally closed. There's NPN, there's PNP. You know, if you go on a DigiKey or something and try to order these, these ones might be discontinued, but similar ones are gonna be $70, $80 a piece. Obviously I wasn't gonna spend that much. So these five I got off eBay, somebody was selling them five of them for 20 bucks or something just because it was just overstock, I guess, discontinued leftover. So I didn't really care, I just figured out. Oh, I can make them work, whatever it is. Well anyway, these are normally closed, which is why the LED is on, and NPN? Now I can't remember. But anyway, it was a pain in the ass to make these things work. I won't go into it too deep, but essentially it wasn't going to work without intermediate circuit. So that is right here. Me and an electrical engineer at work wasted about an hour or two uh, figuring this out. We ended up putting in a couple of opto isolators and had to power those separately. But anyway, it was a pain in the ass. If you're gonna, going to do this, I certainly recommend it because they're reliable. There's no way for metal shavings or oil or anything to get into them. There's no way that if you have like some chips down here, it's not gonna matter because the sensor is still gonna go the same distance. They're super reliable. Just do some research and get ones that are gonna hook right up to your board. Uh, I'm not the guy to answer all those questions for you because we were dealing with this months ago. I already forgot what we did. I tried to forget it. It was a nightmare. But they're in and they're working. So that is good. The other thing I've done, I built this belt guard because I was just having a lot of problems with shavings getting on the belt. So this is just kind of something I just bent up out of aluminum. Oh, I also wanted to show, I was kind of proud of these. I built little roofs to go on here because without them, there would just be a pile of metal shavings that would go up here, so I made it into like a little shed. I thought that was pretty cute. And then these are the pieces of metal that it looks for. Up here, I kind of had to cheat. I laid it out by, by sight, and I was wrong. It ended up not making contact before it hit the top, so I just tapped it out and put in a screw and a washer. So not only did that lower the distance down, it also being steel instead of aluminum makes it see it a little bit sooner. So now this is at Z zero and you can see on the lead screw, still have a tiny bit I could go. Oh, you might see these. Wonder what is that? Is that so I can hook a subwoofer up? No, I made my Z finder setup. Again, this is something I'm not gonna go into great detail on. There are other videos that go into that. Essentially, you just need to make the switch on your board just close. That's all there is. There's a script that you have to just copy paste and put on there. So I got an alligator clip that I'll hook to the spindle. This little gauge block goes on here. The spindle comes down, touches it, beeps. I'll show you how it all works in a little bit. This block it was just a scrap I had laying around. It happened to be 750 one or 752 thousand, something like that. So I just lapped it on a surface plate down to exactly 750, and then I have it set up. So it comes down, finds here, subtracts 750 thousandths and says that is zero. And then it retracts up another quarter inch. So it's 
one inch off the table so it won't interfere hopefully with any clamping or whatever. Uh, so that's all that is. And again, if you want to, you know, figure out how to do that, there's other videos that go in depth into that. This is not that video. This is just sort of an overview. You also notice on my table, I had, actually I'd surfaced it this way in the last video. I, I've since surfaced it this way also. And it gives me a nice flat surface. And I'm always even. I also etched in a new grid. That just kind of helps me line things up. Oh, I ordered a complete set of collets, and this was also one of my first projects I made, was a collet holder. This here is all of the standard and metric sizes, except for the one I have installed right now. You can see I've etched into it all of the sizes. The top row is what they were, what's stamped on them. Millimeter, one millimeter, one sixteenth. But they're in order of size, and through the middle, I have the measurement in thousandths. I don't know why that would ever be necessary, but I don't know. It was cute. Just try to be fancy. So that is all the collets I will ever need. Keyboard, you might notice, is different. I have eliminated the mouse altogether and got a used commercial keyboard with trackpad that I think was probably used at like a point of sale setup at a restaurant or something. It has a whole bunch of blank keys up here that have clear plastic protectors. I can put labels on here, cover them up, and program these hotkeys into Mach 3. So I haven't done it yet, but I intend to have things like Z-axis set and things like that on these keys so that I don't have to have dual purpose keys when I'm doing things. But right now I still just have the arrows page up, page down, controlling spindles, and that's it. But uh, when I want to set the Z, I still have to come up here and hit the auto tool zero. I will show you how that works right now while I'm thinking about it. You also might notice I've slowed down my rapids. It's just a little bit easier to control. So what we'll do, I'll get that set up right here. It's always good to confirm that it's working. So touching here, and you see that pin is flashing. So I know everything's plugged in. You just don't want to crash it if you can avoid it. Hit auto tool zero. There's a short delay programmed in. So I have to come over here and hold it down tight. And now you see it is exactly one inch above the table. So it is good to go. Another thing I wanted to talk about was me being an idiot. You see right now I got some bolts holding this thing up. I think because I didn't have that before, I probably had a little shaving or something get underneath here. I don't know, I never figured out exactly what happened, but I ended up burning up one of these chips and that sucked. Uh, there's a lot of places you can get them cheap, like from China and stuff, but I didn't want to wait possibly weeks to get one, so I ended up having to order. I got them from Mouser. And they were still not that expensive, but it just sucked. Like it fried and then I had to figure out why and I had to replace it and hope that fixed it. And luckily it did, but it sucked. I don't recommend doing it again. So put some standoffs if you don't have the board mounted to something solid, like a smart person, if you're like me and they're just floating around, uh, don't put it on any metal shavings. I also want to talk feeds and speeds for a minute. Um, in the last video, I said that it seemed like things were going to be in the range of like 50 to 150. I don't know where I got that. That is insane. Everything seems to be actually for this machine more in the range of 10 to 20. So like I have not, since I've actually started making serious things, I have not ever gotten up to 50 for a feed rate on this. So I don't know where I got that, but don't put in a feed rate of 150. It's going to like launch itself into space. So that was crazy, that was dumb. I don't know where that came from. All right, I just wanna show you a couple things that I have already made. As I said in the first video, my original goal and primary reason for building this was to do circuit boards. I haven't actually done that much yet because I'm still learning, but I have done some testing. This is a circuit board to maybe be for my tail light project, which right now is on a breadboard. I had already drawn up a plan, so I decided to try it, and I think it's working all right. I think I have good separation. I haven't tried to actually solder anything on there, but right here we have a connector, and then two ICs here, and then these will 
the through holes that transfer to the other side where the LEDs are, but it's pretty good. I got to a point where I think I can make circuit boards and I don't need any circuit boards. Uh, I started playing around with plexiglass because I had some. Screwing around made a crappy Vespa logo because I was using too big of an end mill. I couldn't get much detail. But the reason I started playing with logos is I've had this dream of making an emblem for the back of my 53 Chevy that looks like an original dealer emblem for the dealership where it was purchased in 1953. I have had a saved search on eBay for about 10 years for any auction mentioning that dealership name. And in 10 years, the only actual legitimate auction that has come up that used the name of that dealership was just like some random auto part that had a tag on it that said it was from that dealership. I have never seen an emblem anywhere. So I decided I was just gonna make one. So I just guessed what I thought the emblem would look like. I saved images of hundreds of dealership emblems, tried to find kind of common themes, uh, lettering I liked, and that's kind of what I came up with. So I've been practicing these in plexiglass just to get my shape right. Cutting plexiglass sucks, by the way, unless you have the right cutter because it will load up and you start getting little balls of melted plastic stuck on your end mill. It's been working okay, and I'm pretty pleased with it. And I've started doing some test cuts on aluminum, which I'm hoping I can use the exact same program, but just slow things down and take shallower cuts. So here's how some of those test cuts have done. So far, so good. And I think I'm going to wrap up this video with cutting one of these out in plexiglass and show you how it goes. Okay, so I'm gonna speed up and time lapse some of this, I'm sure. But I'm just gonna show you my process, how I get set up and start going. Now I've been clamping down a piece of cardboard underneath this just so I can cut through it and hopefully not on my table like that. You'll be surprised to know, I'm sure, that this plexiglass came out of the garbage at work. I know, that's so unlike me. Okay, so I'm gonna load up my program here. This is one that I made using JS Cut from a logo I designed in Inkscape. And I took a program to do the 3D aspect of it. We've got this lower section. So I took a program for that and then a program for the cutout and kind of put them together in the same G code. So it is long, 15,000 steps. I have built this model in Fusion 360 but there's such a learning curve on there. I've just been fighting with the cam section of that and I haven't figured it out yet. I'm still working on it. So the JS cut paths are very primitive and silly and like you'll see once this starts going how to like start a letter and then move across and work on another letter and come back. And I don't think Fusion would be that dumb, but I'm still working on it. So I've got my program loaded up and I've got my zero set and I'm just gonna go ahead and run it. Unlike in the first video, I will turn on my spindle power supply. I found the spindle works better with power. I'm gonna set my zeros where I'm at now. So here we go. One thing I forgot to mention, I did say, I think, I mentioned that cutting plexiglass sucks with two fluid end mills. Did I say that? I don't remember. So I'm gonna be standing here with a little scribe and occasionally knocking chips off this end mill. I believe a one flute end mill that was sharp and made for this would not do this. This happens to be a two flute end mill that I got in a box of used bits. So that's what I deal with.
Okay, so based on past experience, I have learned that now all these letters are just full of this fuzz that sucks to get off because I'm using the wrong end mill. Uh, so I'm gonna go back to my program to the final depth outline cut, and I'm just gonna speed it up and run it around just one more time. I think that'll just help clean it up a little. That was something I wanted to experiment and try the last time I ran this. So the question is, see if I can find in 15,000 lines of G-code where that final pass starts. I think I saw it. When I edit my G-code, I try to put a line of dashes, so hopefully it'll jump out at me as it whizzes by. There it is, third outline. Okay, and then I can run from here, cycle start, and then it asks, do you want to start the spindle? Yes. And then it gets in place, and then I hit start. I think that was an excellent idea. I think that made all the difference. Yeah, I think I'm gonna do that from now on with my scripts. I'm just gonna run one more faster pass around the outside. Since I didn't go inside the letters, you can see it's still all just kind of a mess in there. And I usually just end up going back in here with a little scribe and just hand cleaning it out, which partially defeats the purpose of having a machine that you can program to do whatever you want. Okay, well, there's the thing I just cut. It looks pretty good, except not as good as that one, and that's not because I'm getting worse. It's because I totally ran the wrong G-code before I had fixed this C that here is completed, and here it is not. Which brings me to another struggle I'm working on, is how to name files. I go inside, I do some work, I put it on a jump drive, so I mean, you know what, would this be like emblem 1, emblem 2, emblem 3. Then after a few rounds of that, you're like, what number am I on? So then you're like, well, I'll just say new. And then you're like, new two, new three, new four. And then you're like, what number am I on? Final, final one, final two. So like, I really need a system for just naming things. So, cause I mean, as you can see, there's been a few iterations here. So yeah, there's probably a way professionals do that. I don't know what it is right now. I'm just stumbling through life like a caveman. So there you have it. That's gonna wrap it up for this video. I came out here, got really hot and sweaty, and made a big mess and cut out a pointless thing just for you. So there you go. Hope you enjoyed it. Uh, more things will be coming up with this machine. I actually have some real projects. When I finally cut the emblem for for good, the final the final go of it, I'll probably show you that. Lots of ideas, not a lot of time. So we'll call that it. We'll see you in the next video. Have a good one.